The snow really land on top? The snow land on top, guys? This was the person that Snow was talking about that he killed. I killed the old me. The old me in question. I don't think this video needs any introduction. You guys know exactly why we are here. We are here, obviously, to talk about the ballad of songbirds and snakes. It's the things we love most that destroy us. The Hunger Games prequel, we are here to discuss all of it. We have been on a Hunger Games marathon. I don't know how many times I have watched the original trilogy. As of right now, in this moment, I have seen The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes three times in theaters. Yes, I have, and I plan to go see it more times because it's just, something about it has got me hooked. Now, I know it's not the perfect movie. Even on my letterbox, I gave it four stars for every single time I watched it. But there is a rewatchability quality about this movie that just transcends. This movie stars Rachel Zegler and Tom Blythe, two newbies to the blockbuster scene, but newbies that will stick around for a very long time because their talent shown throughout this movie is just so addicting. It is so addicting. I am so glad that new Hollywood It Girls are back. I'm happy about it. I'm happy that we're actually having Hollywood stars. The fact that like Rachel Zegler is being cast in so many hit things, it's like you can't deny the star power there. Not a lot of you guys are ready to accept that, but I've like always known but I'm like a little bit different. This movie is all told through this perspective of Coriolanus Snow. And this period of his life really does dictate where he goes, whether he crosses that line to become good or if he crosses the line to turn to the dark side, basically. We start off the movie in the dark days, showing Snow and Tigress as kids running through this war-torn country. This is the first time we get to see throughout the Hunger Games universe, the HGG. <laughs> The HGU. The HGU. This is the first time we see through the Hunger Games universe what the dark days and the war really meant. We heard stories about it and we saw that little film at the beginning of the reaping in the first Hunger Games movie, but we're so far away from that at that point that it really is not something that we are connected to in the film. So this is the first time we see how it really affected and why the grown-ups in the Hunger Games trilogy truly have such spite towards the districts because they were the children that lived through the war. Then we see hot Coriolanus Snow sitting in his bed with his blonde curls. And it's like, why did you make Snow so cute? As the makers of the films, you want me to want him. And I do, I want him bad. And like, what did you expect to happen that once you gave him a buzz cut that I was gonna lessen my attraction to him? Oh my God, it made it go up by 10 points. No, they knew what they were doing. They wanted to make him super hot and sexy. And they did that in the Hunger Games trilogy as well. He's getting ready to see if he won the Plinth Prize, which is uh, basically a scholarship. He's basically trying to see if he won a scholarship to university. And Tigress is like, I made your shirt. Like I, I took the tesserae from the bathroom tiles. Like they're DIY queens. And we're seeing kind of how they live in squalor, basically. They're, they don't have much food. They're saving it for their grandma. This is the first time that we see that just because your capital doesn't mean that you live a luxurious life. Uh, this is the first time we associate poverty with the capital, which is a really interesting thing that we've never seen. Everybody that's capital is different from district and they're so much better than them when Snow was probably living a worse life than most people in districts. I'm sorry. I'm like, girl, at least they can eat. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, if you want to get nasty, we can get nasty. Anyways, during this, we find out that there is no plinth prize that will be given out today. They've changed the rules because no one is watching the freaking Hunger Games anymore. They're in the red on Social Blade. They're not doing well. They basically flopped. 10 years into the game, 10th season of the Hunger Games, and it flopped. And the president is thinking, 
maybe this is not how we how we do this anymore and the challenge for the students of this class to win the plinth prize is to mentor a tribute from each district and make them into a spectacle to perform for the games so people tune in lucy gray bear the reaping for district 12 starts and lucy graybeard is given to snow as a punishment from dean highbottom lucy gray kind of eats up in this scene and like i know people have very mixed opinions about this scene because some people thought it was a little bit like questionable but she goes up and she has a little stick in her hand and she puts it into the redhead's dress redhead starts screaming turns out the redhead that's the mayor's daughter that's the mayor's daughter, and the mayor's like, help my daughter, help my daughter. By the way, did we know that districts even had mayors? No, I did not. I did not know that districts had mayors. And like, what do the mayors do? Like, I guess do mayors do the same thing that they do here? I don't know, it was just like first mayor drop. I didn't know that there was like mayors in the district. And then Lucy Graybeard goes up, steps up the steps and gets whacked whacked she was ah then we hear from the audience you can't take my heart you can't take my history you can take my part it's a mystery whoa glee glee you guys know i love singing in any movie this is basically a musical to me i love the how much emotion rachel is able to put into each performance the way she can put a quiver into her facial expression the way she can wobble her voice to evoke that emotion that someone would have while singing their assumed last performance of their life and at the end of this performance she ends it with a classic, a classic line that we'll never forget. You can kiss my ass. And Snow is looking at her like she is Demi Lovato in Camp Rock. Like he is Joe Jonas, she is Demi. Like at that moment, you can't tell me that he didn't fall in love. To top it all off, she gives one hell of a little curtsy towards the big, big audience with a big old stink face on. What can be better than that? If I'm gonna go out, at least I'm gonna serve while doing it. And can we blame her? No, there's not a lot of tiger scenes in this that really show off a lot of her character, but I think she's talked about a lot more in the book. She is the person pulling Snow to the other side, the one trying to remind him of who he truly is. And once he is finally lost, it really does create such a drastic arc in the story to have her still there. Tigress is his cousin, the person that he loves, the person that he trusts. And even then, all those years later, he tossed her aside. And I love that because it shows that he would have done the same exact thing to Lucy if she stayed around. I feel like she's gonna go overlooked because there's so many things to talk about, but I wanted to make that point clear that I love her addition. I think she's so vital. And I think Hunter Schaefer did an amazing job at playing her. Hunter Schaefer is an amazing actress, but I love how, how much uh, femininity and delicacy she brings to the the not only like the visual storytelling of it all but like just through her lines and her empathy for it all i think it's a really good contrast to snow throughout the movie and now we have finally arrived at lucy gray baird and coriolana snow meeting for the very first time this is a very big deal this is a meet cue basically but not because it was planned. But like he brought a rose, so it's like romantic. So she gets out of the train and he's like, oh my God, there's Bay. There's Bay. Let me go see her. He gives her a rose and she eats a petal. Very Finnick like of her. Basically, they're like rounding up the tributes and they're like, let's get into this, like, not the train, but like a big, big like van of some sort. They're like, get in the van. So they get into the van and then one of the guys tries to run away. Coriolanus is like, ah, oh, I'm taking the opportunity. He runs onto the train. What was going through his brain? I don't know. That man's got a skirt and he's not afraid to use it. He jumps in there and everyone's like, what? But also like, okay, it's time to go. It's time, it, it's about to go down basically. Reaper and Bobbin are all like, let's fucking get him. And then Lucy Gray is like, you got family at home? They'll kill them if you hurt him. And plus he's my mentor, so I might need him. 
The car stops, tips, and guess what this motherfucker does? He tells Lucy to get up and grabs her around the waist. And she's like hanging off of him by his waist. What am I supposed to do? Not fall in love with him? Like, I don't understand what you want. You're really, you're trying to make me do the impossible. Like that is something I noticed the first time where I was like, wow, that's my man. And he's really not, like he's not anyone's man. He's not anyone's man. He's his own man. He's honestly probably like in love with himself. Like he honestly gives like Sue Sylvester where it's like the only person that can marry you is yourself because you're so horrendous to be around and you're just pathetic. They get dumped into a cage. And what is that cage? It's a capital zoo. And our host, Lucky Flickerman. I call him Lucky Flickerman because I'm not saying Lucretius Lucky Flickerman every single time. He turns, he's trying to say, whoa, here are the terms of tributes. They look crazy. And then he turns around, he goes, What's he doing in there? Is that Academy Rouge? This is a really important scene because it is what strikes the initiative for Snow to speak up about why he was in there. And he's like, you know what? Like I was actually serving, like I was actually proving a really big point. Like you need to show these people who they are before they go into a game because not only do people want something to root for, they want something to root against. And he's like, honestly, like, the reason people aren't tuning in is because you're not giving us enough backstory. This turns into a hot topic of whether or not it would be a good idea. So he writes up a proposal for Dr. Gall. And of course, little old Clemmy is like, we, I've also not talked about Clementine the entire movie. Her name is not even Clem, Clementine, it's Clemencia. Clemencia, I've not talked about, even though I'm dressed up exactly like she would be, because I would love to say that I'm dressed up like Snow, but that just like would not make sense. I don't look anything like Snow. So I have to say I'm dressed up as Clemencia. Clemencia really doesn't have a very vital role in this movie. I think she has a way bigger role in the book, but in the movie, she's very much just a lesson for Snow to learn from. So the tributes and the mentors walk into tour the arena. They're being filmed in the arena to see them get their first looks at the arena. It's like a reality TV show. It is a reality TV show. I don't know why I keep saying that it's like a reality TV show. It is a reality TV show. They're touring it, they're looking around. They're like, oh my God, this is like, makes no sense. Cause this literally, is like an it, it, there's no game to this it's just fight ridiculous it's like th these people are not content creators because they don't know what's entertaining until they do <laughs> until they do they they don't know and then they really know and then all of a sudden something serious happens a bomb goes off in the top of the dome. I love this shot, by the way. This was like such an epic moment to watch. It, I don't know how they did it, but it basically circles Corio and Lucy Gray when the explosions are going off and we can see the impact like hitting them and going off around them. And it is so cool. I think they probably put them in like an air tunnel or something, but it's one of my favorite shots in the movie. I feel like it's so movie. You know, when you watch a movie and there's some movie shots where I'm like, yes. It's like a movie and I loved it. That was, that's one of my favorite shots of this movie still to this day. Lucy Gray gets up and then Snow gets boom, boom. Down goes down. I love it. Also, I love it when like a uh, Viola Davis's character does that Dr. Gall, when she goes down with the snow, down in the cage. She's so weird. Seneca wasn't fun. Heavensby wasn't a fun game maker. She's over there doing chants and poems. I love it. I literally love it. Down with the snow in the cage. Down. It's like, why did she say that? Down with snow. He's on the floor with a big cement pillar on him. And it's on fire, of course. Lucy Gray turns around. She turns around. She looks at him. She runs back. She pulls it off. It doesn't make sense how she was able to pull that off of him. I would love to know her strength and what she's, um, what she's squatting. Then he visits Lucy Gray the night before the games and brings her a compact filled with rat poison. He does not ever let up on this poison thing. Through his fucking like 70 years of living or 80 years or whatever, this bitch does not let poison go. I don't know why anyone couldn't predict his next move when this, the same, he does the same move every time. And then she's like, oh my God, like he's kind of like taking care of me. And she leans in for a kiss and he backs away. Right then I would have started crying. I would have actually been done. That would have been enough to make me 
not try in those games. Then he shows a little bit of jealousy. He's like, is this even real? Like that boy in your song. And she's like, that was literally just revenge. Like that was about my boyfriend that cheated on me. And that's the whole reason why I'm in this game is because his new girlfriend is the mayor's daughter. And he said my name on purpose so she could get revenge on me and get rid of me. And then he's like, okay, you're like my bookie thing forever. Like you're my bookie pie princess and I'm gonna protect you in those games. And I'm gonna like make sure you live. It's like, okay. He just believed her so easily. Today's video is kindly sponsored by Raycon. I love my Raycons. I've been using my Raycon everyday earbuds for a very long time. And they are my go-to earbuds that I just pop into my bag wherever I'm going, whether I'm shopping, whether I'm working, whether I'm taking public transportation. I always have my Raycon everyday earbuds within my bag to make sure that I can use them at any point in my day. Raycons don't stop at their everyday earbuds. They have also released a Raycon Home and Raycon Power Tech products. This includes a Magic 180 charging cable and also a faucet filter. Raycon makes it so you don't have to choose between premium quality or an affordable price. Raycon Everyday Earbuds come at about half the price of other premium audio brands on the market right now. Raycon products have earned tens of thousands of five-star reviews. And if you're still debating, you can shop Raycon with zero risk with free returns, free shipping, and buy now, pay later options. Raycons are a universally useful gift this holiday season. And so if you're looking for a last minute gift to buy anyone in your family, your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, your cousins, your grandparents, Raycons are the perfect gift to buy anyone in your family or any of your friends. I give a lot of Raycons out during the holiday season because they are just that good of a gift. And right now Raycon is offering limited time bundles on some of their best selling products, including fitness kits and everyday audio kit and several others. I think the everyday bundles are amazing. The headphone one and the earbud one are just an amazing deal this holiday season because that is just like Christmas shopping is done at that point when if you get the everyday headphone bundle you have three gifts right there or two gifts and one for yourself this holiday season you guys can get premium audio and power tech at a great price and you guys can save even more by using my code or going to buyraycon.com slash trend to get 15% off site-wide thank you Raycon for sponsoring today's video so we're about to start the games we have the tributes walking in to the arena. Enjoy the show. Enjoy the show. Enjoy the show. So all the tributes go to their mark and the mentors are behind their little Macintosh computers looking at their little screen. It's weird to think that this is all set in a very dystopian futuristic world while also having a lot of remnants of the 50s which might seem a little bit backwards but it makes sense that like we would uh, repeat certain decades after similar events occur. It starts counting down. Five, four, three, two, one, boom. It's a class bell ring. Interesting way to set off the games. I like it though. The reason I do like it, I don't like the dramatization of it. I think it's a little bit corny cheesy. I like the implications of it rather than the actual uh, final effect that it had because while watching it it was a little cheesy a little corny but I like the implication that it uh, kind of adds the sense of like their children like this is a school bell because they're like their children they're, they would all be in high school and I love this opening bloodbath scene because it's the first time we get to see finally how they were reacting to it it was literally like stab shoot buzzer buzzer mentor throw up it was literally like a dance we were playing i love it that it's finally showing like yes in the first hunger games we see we see the brutality of it all we've never seen it through the eyes of the capital it's really interesting how they did that while trying to make these tributes into spectacles while also in turn creating a bond between the tributes and the mentors. And I found that to be very interesting for some of them, for some of them as, as we see. Jessup is dead. I don't know why I said it so abruptly. Jessup is dead and Coral's pack, which is district four, has an alliance and they are after Lucy Gray. I don't know what the fuck Coral had against Lucy Gray. They almost get Snow and Tejanus when they are in the arena. She's like, you might've gotten away this time, gorgeous but you're a songbird? 
is next on my list. And I don't know what the fuck is up with her. Like, I really don't know why she was so intent on getting Lucy Gray. Like, out of all the people, wouldn't you want to try to get the stronger ones? If you had an alliance, wouldn't you go after someone much, much stronger than everyone else? Like, Reaper? And the Starbucks Barista Pack uh, Tumblr crew circles Lucy Gray. They circle her, and then Snow was like, oh. I've, I've actually got a trick up my sleeve. Which like, he does, like this is honestly so cool. He sends in eight waters and the drones come flying in from every, every angle, fast as hell and distract all the tributes and they make it so Lucy Gray can escape. And one of the other mentors goes, hey, you can't attack the tributes. And Snow goes, I'm just sending water. And it's like, yes, my man, my man's my man's, you are just sending water and I love you. It's like, you are just sending water, right? Yeah, yeah. This is when poison comes back into play and Lucy Greybeard takes one of the water bottles and decides, oh, I'm gonna put that little stuff that Snow gave me. I'm gonna put the, the poison. We find out who's gonna end up drinking this fucking water. It was not any of the pack that was attacking Lucy Grey. It happens to be none other than, and I quote, tuberculosis on legs. Like, why did he say that? But like, also like, they, I, I, would, I die. Cause it's like, why? Would you say that? Why would you say that? Cause like now my entire brain is out of the, the horrors of the Hunger Games and I'm just thinking of tuberculosis on legs. Which is also the entire point. Like Lucky Flickerman and the hostess job is to distract you from the true horrors and what you're watching and truly make it into a game and a spectacle. And we are even exactly at the capital because the whole theater laughed. The whole fucking theater laughed because it was funny. Because why would he say that? Like, why would you say tuberculosis on legs? That's not a real thing that I can't. And then we see Reaper. This scene was one of the hardest to watch when he mourns Dill's death. Cause that was who he was trying to protect throughout this entire thing. He was like, Dill, stay by me. Do not leave my side. Like he was all about protecting her. And he had the biggest opportunity to win. He gathers up all the dead bodies of uh, the tributes and puts them in one pile side by side. And then he goes and grabs the Capitol flag and rips it down, gasps from the audience. <gasps> he can't do that. You need to leave. And he's torn down the Capitol flag and he puts it over their bodies. And he looks into the camera and he goes, are you going to punish me now? I said, are you? going to punish me now fucking cuts him off and then it goes to dr gall going in breaking news the president's son our beloved president's son has been killed as of late as he, he says he has succumbed to his injuries he is no longer with us and I will not let these rebels make a fool out of my games, even if that means having no victor at all. Why well, was that kind of good? And the rest of the standing tributes are taken out by the snakes, AKA the rainbow of destruction. I hate this. When I say I hate this is because I think it is a really rushed way to get through the ending tributes. One is not taken down by snakes and that happens to be none other than Lucy Graybeard. And she starts singing. Rachel Zegler delivers a powerful performance, not only through her voice, but through her expressions and the rage she portrays towards the camera. Her realization that the snakes aren't taking her down like they did to others, but still having a sense of fear that something else will probably happen. She doesn't know she's the final victor at this point in the games. They have not developed a strategy to let the tributes know how many tributes are left within the arena. Once you watch the entire movie, you come to the conclusion of this, but truly during this scene is where you go, there is no one else that could play this role. So after Rachel Zegler delivers one of the most crucial performances of her career, I think that will change the history of film possibly forever. Uh, Snow begs for her to be let out. He goes, let her out. Let her out, she's won. 
And then Tigress is like, let her out! And then all of them start chanting and becoming very passionate about this. And then Gaul's like, okay, let him out. Corio goes to try to find Lucy Gray, Lucy Gray. The way he says Lucy Gray is so funny to me and I don't know why, but it sounds so like innocent and childlike when he says it. Lucy Gray, Lucy Gray. It's almost kind of sinister in a way. Basically he's fit with a big old surprise that we done caught you. He was basically in his own Seneca Crane moment where he's in a room and suddenly he's like, oh my God, wait, this is not the room that I think I was supposed to be in. He's literally like confronted with the things that he did wrong, which was his mother's compact and his handkerchief with his initials on it. He gets punished by being sent to districts to be a peacekeeper for 20 years before he can be allowed to join the capital again. He becomes a peacekeeper, he gets a buzz cut and he looks really sexy and it's really annoying. It's really annoying and on his bus there, he is also met with a fellow familiar face, which is Sejanus, who is like, like I graduated and then I heard they were sending you to 12. So like I had to come, which is like kind of romantic if you think about it. Like I think Snow, I think this was a love triangle that like no one wants to admit. And so Snow's like, yes, like Bestie's here. Like Bestie's here, I'm not going to find Bay. Like it's really like, it's a very big moment for me. Like maybe I'm like exiled from the capital, but like Bestie and Bay are like in my life. And then we see him doing peacekeeper things. And then they, and then the peacekeeper and the peacekeepers get a weekend pass to go out into town. You see a little girl who is now familiar. And she's like, it sure is hot in here, but it's about to get a whole lot hotter with the type of stuff that we're cooking up in here. I don't think that's what she said. Coming out is the one, the only, Lucy Gray Bear. And then she starts singing her little song and she sings it and it's the, one of the best songs, one of the best songs. Like there is there is nothing better than like a song that just wants to make you get up and boogie. That's impacting history like no other history you've seen before. Like it's gonna be 10 years from now where I still know every lyric and I'm never, and it'll be years since I've heard the song. Anyways, Corio finds Lucy Gray in the woods singing the hanging tree that she wrote for Snow after witnessing the executions by the hanging tree. One of the things I love about this scene, although I love the song and I think it's like super important and I think it's really important that this song was not only a song that is used as the anthem for the rebellion years later, I love that it's a song that Snow knows was only written for him. And I know he was like, they're singing it wrong. And 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 Snow, can we get you singing it so we could hear the correct version? Could we have a, a Snow musical? So yada, 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 he tells her how he got there. They have a moment, they kiss. I kind of melt, I kind of fall for it. And I stand by this, even if you guys might not think that I'm right, I do think, now this does not mean that I think this is healthy. I do think he was in love with her. Do I believe that that love was pure and uh, healthy? No, 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 no. I think he was in love with her in an obsession, a uh, very objectifying way where he was so obsessed with her, so in love with her that he wanted to own her. And that kind of relates to the capital mindset of owning things and people. Okay, so Janus kind of pisses me off. He's planning something. He's talking to people who are imprisoned in uh, District 12. I can't stand him in a way that, <laughs> in a sense that um, he pissed me off, not for his morals. I think his heart is the right place. He does not create a steady plan at all. He is a sloppy plan, talking in the open to people, not trying to hide himself at all, not knowing who these people are before he gets into contact with them. His heart is in the right place, but he, and he wants to become a medic, but he does no plan. He has no plan set up to even become a medic to where he would actually have some sort of status quo to maybe help out these people. Oh my God. Do I think he deserved his fatal end? Do I think he deserved what happened to him? No, I do wish he was a little bit smarter. I do wish he was a little bit smarter, but I think the great part of that is that because he was district turned capital, he can never go back in a sense that like his father said, you can never be a, a district again once you become capital. 
he's never gonna know just how much this means to people how sloppy he was with how he acted within this plan showed his privilege and his naivety because of that privilege and he would have been all in katniss but he could have never been katniss due to how he was raised and you know his father's reputation like he just could not ever he always had a safety blanket until he didn't now let's talk about this lake scene because if we know anything about me we know that i love i love cutesy girly things and i love something that's happy Coriolana snow happy scenes one minute and 30 seconds if i had it this good for about an hour until i ruined it for myself i would be a hater too i would also be like really mad um and a hater for the rest of my life if i lost the love of my life because of my own actions but i guess i i, I assume that he wouldn't think there his own actions right that led him to that lucy gray sings a song to snow called pure as driven snow which I also love. We will get to the rankings later of the songs and the meaning of them all. I love, I love the songs. Um, I love the meaning of this song because even though it sounds very sweet and it sounds very romantic of it all, it talks about, I love you, I need you, I want you. Like it's very much like a, a longing for someone. The title basically tells you all you need to know. It's called pure as driven snow, driven over snow. It's not pure anymore. It's flattened and dirty it's gross snow walks out and he finds the janus with uh character spruce billy and the mayor's daughter mayfair with guns in the middle and he's like ah, why are you guns he didn't do that but <laughs> and so janus is like tweaking out he's literally like i didn't know there was gonna be guns i didn't know snow was like why would you not think that you like thought you could trust them but it's like not the only fact that I agree with Snow in the Fence, like, I don't agree that, like, district people should not be trusted, but it's like, why would you think that they were just running away? It's like, obviously, they were rebels trying to attack the capital. Like, I don't know what else you were expecting. They're the lowest district. What do you think that they would be doing? And then, like, Lucy Gray walks in and she's like, I thought this was a classy party. And because like, there's like guns, and there's the Mayfair's daughter. And then the Mayfair is like, oh, hell no, she's not a part of this. Oh, my dad is going to wring your neck when he finds out. And she's like becoming such a hater. And it's honestly like, it's not very pretty to be a hater in a time like this. Snow kills her. Which honestly, it's like out of all his deaths, like I kind of like that one a lot. There's no worse crime than being annoying. And then Lucy Gray is freaking, Sejanus is bawling. Snow makes a plan to hide the guns and promises Lucy Gray and Sejanus that he will get them out of this and that like he's gonna basically save the day, which is impossible that he would save the day for Sejanus because he already turned him in. He already sent a recording of the Jabber Jays incriminating him. Snow thinks that there is a bunch too many loose ends and that he might as well just escape because everything is Panem and he's going to be found out if someone finds those guns and he won't be accepted anyway. So he might as well run away with his buki and should have just kept it at that. So Janus is found out by the peacekeepers and is brought up and begs to Snow for his help, pleading with him to help him. And they play the audio incriminating him at his execution as he is hanged by the tree. And Snow has now killed three people. Lucy Gray and Corio meet at the hanging tree and make their way out of town. They talk about their lives and the lives they've taken. And Snow says, three's enough for me. That makes Lucy Gray pause. She goes, pause. What was that? He goes, the old me. I killed him so I could be here with you. <laughs> it's like things like this really make you speechless. But we skirt on past that really quick. He goes to find the fishing rods and he stumbles across the guns that were used to kill Mayfair. Lucy Gray was like, if you, if you get rid of that gun, you'll be free to go back to the capital. And he goes, no more loose ends. And Lucy Gray goes, except for me. And he's like, what? He's like, what are you talking about? What do you mean by that? Baby, what do you mean? He didn't say that, but he was like, you wouldn't tell anyone, right? <laughs> uh, None of us here are telling anyone anything, right? Anybody in the room telling anyone that I killed three people? 
No. And then Lucy Gray is like, I'm gonna go pick a, uh, I'm gonna go pick some Katniss. And then he's like, Lucy Gray, it's still raining outside. She goes, well, I'm not made of sugar, am I? And she like is holding her knife. This is not a knife, but she's like holding her knife and she's like, well, I'm not made of sugar, am I? She never returns. He goes to look for her, panicked. He finds one of the gifts that he had given Lucy Gray early on in the film, which is his mother's shawl. Uh, and he picks it up and is bit by a little snake. Talk about snakes in this movie. And he looks at it and he like, this is where it all turns, where he gets like that like really scary man look. And I don't know if this makes sense, but he gets that really scary man look where they're like laughing, but they're like, mean and they're scary and he's laughing and he go he's like is that po is that poisonous and he's like are are you trying to kill me is that what this is lucy gray i said are you trying to kill me after everything i've done for you he like punches the ground him like punching the dirt was so like man of him and like man in the biggest insult way possible i do not mean th that is nev men punching things is never going to be like a compliment to you. Uh uh. He hears the footsteps and we see a little shadow in the background and a little girl running and then he shoots and then we hear a gasp and then he follows the tracks and then there's no more. And then the hanging tree starts singing coming out from all around him, surround sound for real. And they're mocking him torturing him, surrounding him, and he shoots in the air. Ah! Um, love that scene. It's the most pivotal scene. I asked a bunch of people what it was the most like vital scene for them. They, a lot of people say this scene because it's like, it is really like a train wreck like, that you're witnessing. And it's hard to watch, it really is. One thing I wanna point out about this scene is I love it that this, for me, this is my interpretation of the scene is that this is why he chooses to torture the tributes with Jabber Jays within Catching Fire because he was once tortured by the Mocking Jays within his lifetime. And it's so interesting to see his torture techniques used on later in the trilogy and seeing what he had been through. He like gets it together. He pulls himself together and is like, you know what, like, I don't need a woman, like, and he becomes like a woman hater for like, sure, like, he's just not chill anymore. He's not chill like that anymore. And he's like, I'm gonna go back to the capital where I deservedly need to be. Because earlier in the film, he got like, basically, they were like, you're really good. And he's like, yeah, because like, no one else knows how to read here. Um, and they're like, you are gonna be wasted here. Like, you need to go to like, two or one and get like a real wage. And maybe you can like, go to the capital again. And so he's like, mm, I'm gonna get on that bus and go to two. And then he like gets on the bus and they're like, actually like Dr. Gall wants to see you in the Capitol. So like you're going to the Capitol right now. And he's like, hey, Dr. Gall, like what's up? And she's like, oh my God, like, and she's like, basically you're gonna be studying under me. And he's like, I can't like afford that. I'm sorry, I can't afford the tuition. And she's like, uh, actually Sejanus Plinth's parents decided to pay for your tuition. So I guess you won that Plinth's prize after all, but like little do they know that you like sold out their son um, to get my attention. And no one will know about that except for you and me. He finally like grows his hair back. He's all dressed up and he goes like his grandmam, his grandmam, his Mima, Snow's Mima is like, ah, you look so handsome. Like, oh, I love you. And then he's like, well, what do you think, Tigress? And Tigress is like, I think you look just like your father, Coriolanus. And it literally sounds like it's like cut, it, it literally sounds like it's like, it's like cutting her up to say this. Cause it's like, oh, uh, the realization that, that that's not the snow that she witnessed before the games, like, ugh. Snow has one final conversation with High Bottom and High Bottom reveals that he's been self-medicating ever since he created the Hunger Games. High Bottom tried to stop it, but uh, Snow's father did not let him do that. And he has been self-medicating ever since that due to the fact that he helped create the monstrosity that is the Hunger Games. High Bottom almost got the games to stop until Coriolanus gave them ideas to continue on the games. Then Snow kills him with poison again. After that, it's like, we get it. You like poison. It's like, it's like, does anyone want to try new things now? Does anybody want to like be creative? 
no one wants to be creative these days. Nobody wants to work these days. And his last line of the movie, his last line of the movie, is so up for interpretation. Snow lands on top. Of what? Suzanne definitely wrote that with so much meaning and it was just, oh, it was just annihilated by every horny person out there. You just gave that audio to a lot of people. You gave that soundbite to a lot of people that I don't think need to have that. In other news, I'm getting sweaty. I give this movie a four to five stars because even though I love the story and the lore of it, I do think the movie has a little bit of flaws. Do I think this movie could have been split into two movies? Yes, of course. Do I think there were some parts that were rushed? Yes, of course. Do I think there's so much to elaborate on the book that you could have split this into two parts? Yes, of course. Do I still love the movie? Yes, of course.